Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to, as difficult as it is, pick up from where we left off Friday before spring break. And if you recall, uh, we did the five people up front kind of modeling the way the whole program was going to flow. And uh, I know that I got the class announcement out late uh, this morning. I should have sent it out yesterday, but despite that, I hope that several of you either have fantastic memories or were able to watch that 20-minute segment as that plays into uh, precisely what I want to formalize today. <clears throat> but before I do that, I'll go ahead and open it up. To, oh, before I open it up to questions, I've also posted assignment eight, and that involves using arrays, and uh, since I'm occupied in class here working on the project, the introduction to arrays will occur in lab, so for those who are here for the Monday lab, you got that uh, this morning. I'll be doing the same kind of thing Tuesday morning. That's right. It's uh, 9.30, yeah. Uh, doing that for the Tuesday, Thursday lab folks tomorrow morning. So you'll be want to be sure to attend lab so that you don't miss out on that. Uh, assignment 8 is due a week from today. Okay. I believe it's fairly straightforward. And what I strongly recommend that you do is attend the lab, obviously, to get the material, unless you're already feeling like you know how arrays work in the language. And also working on the code for assignment 8 as soon as possible, because I tentatively, I haven't posted it as a due date yet, but I'm tentatively making the project due a week from today. And that may very well get pushed back to something like Wednesday of next week. I need to see how far that I get over the next couple of classes. But the last thing you're going to want to be doing is mucking around with both the project as well as assignment eight. Uh, it's definitely quite a handful to handle both of them. So while we're occupied with analysis and design activities for the project, that's the time that you should be really cranking on cranking out the code for assignment 8 so that by the time you're ready to code the project, the assignment's out of the way. So with that as a backdrop of where we're at and where we're going, are there any questions about that or anything else? Okay. I will, so that I don't forget, I will go ahead and give you the word of the day. Hmm? Um, yeah, I guess, sure. Sure. <laughs> well, you can use it today. So find your, you have something to label your roommate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you use it on any instructor except for me. All right. So what we need to do is we need to begin understanding precisely what it is we need to do in the project and somehow translating that ultimately into code. Okay. And the 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 five volunteers that I had up here on Friday uh, is hopefully giving you, gave you kind of a sense for how things flow together, but I want to formalize that in the process that is actually used by object-oriented designers in ferreting out this information. Uh, and in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to form you into groups, or I'll let you self-assemble into groups. I'm not going to make you draw straws or anything. And I'm looking for groups of uh, three people, no more than groups of four. I prefer groups of three work the best. 
and we're, I'm going to have you work in groups for a few minutes. I'm going to wander around for a few minutes. I won't be able to hit all the groups. Then I'm going to bring it back up here and talk about what you're doing and what you're not doing and, and give you some ways of moving forward. And I'm going to iterate that way two or three times this period. And again, my objective is to for you to start to learn the process for solving an, a problem, taking an object-oriented approach. And it's, so although this Joust application is so simple, you would never actually meet a company doing something so simple, the process we're going through isn't authentic. In fact, as recently as, um, it was the beginning of this semester actually, someone who had taken this course, uh, no, well, I, I don't know the timing, it was recently. I think it was someone who had taken the course and then over the summer had a, an internship and the stuff that we will do, start doing today, he said, you know, I went to this employer at this internship, and that's exactly what they pulled out and exactly what we did. Okay, so the process we use is authentic. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to start figuring out the member functions for classes. So what classes do we have? We know we have knight and we know we have weapon, right? So those are the two classes I want you to focus on. And we know that those classes have a set of data. Uh, let's see. Let me look at this. Yeah, I'll copy this over here and I'll talk, call it class data dot text. All right, so here's what we have in today's notes. Uh, joust and round, we would have noted that joust and round didn't really end up being their own classes based on the demo that we did with the folks up here up front. Round ended up being something we never really kept track of. It was just that the joust occurred in rounds, and so we could image, imagine some sort of loop happening with rounds, but it didn't merit a class in and of itself. Uh, likewise with joust, uh, we didn't have, an in, although I suppose it's within the realm of reason, we didn't really have a separate joust class, but instead had a main program, which was managing the joust between the knights and weapon. So that, uh, for simplicity as well, we don't want to make that a class on its own. So that really leaves us with two classes. The knight has a name. Star, we, the examples we had were starry and stormy, had a stamina, had a boolean, uh, true or false, as to whether or not that knight was on the horse. And then each knight uh, had a, a weapon. The type of the weapon was sword or lance or some similar uh, designator. Had an integer representing the hit chance. And even though... a, a that is a probability, a number between 0 and 1. I'm kind of simplifying the whole thing, uh, dealing with whole numbers. So rather than having a floating point number between 0 and 1, I'm saying that the hit chance is somewhere between 1 and 100, representing a percentage. And then uh, the stamina required is each time the knight uses the weapon, a certain amount of stamina is required for that knight to successfully use it. So that ended up being the basic data that we had. And then if you recall, I played a class as well. I was the random class and uh, people would ask me for random numbers by saying what would they, what was exactly the message they would give to me or ask of me? Get. And then I'd give you a random number between 1 and 100, right? So that's what we have. And again, I've provided random, so that's not something you need to write. So what I want you to do is focus on these two. And uh, I'm going to want you to go into groups, and I want you to figure out two things. One is, what are the member functions of knight and weapon? And two, what do each of these member functions do? I'm only going to give you a short period of time, between five and ten minutes, to do that. And I want you to see how easy or difficult you're finding that process. And then I want to provide you with a tool and then have you try to do it again. So with that, I will leave this up right here. Uh, go ahead and at this point find uh, preferably two other people to join up with and start trying to figure out what you think 
the member functions are of knight and weapon. What are the things you do with knight? What are the things you do with weapon? And I'll walk around. So off you go. <coughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right. So I I clearly haven't given you enough time to complete this task. Uh, I wanted you to work on it long enough to get an impression. So there are two things that we've done generally. Is we've kind of tried to figure out what kind of data we've. Excuse me. There are several things. One we've identified possible classes. Another, a second thing we've done is for each of those classes, identifying the data that comprises each class. And then the third thing is what you're trying to do now is determine what the member functions are. Okay? And if I was to ask you what is easier, figuring out the data of a class or figuring out the functions of the class, what would you say? Which is easier? Function data. data. Yeah. The functions is a, a much more difficult proposition. Yes? And I uh, have tried to, to show you with the, the interactions up here the kinds of things that you do with these. So let me introduce a different way of actually drawing out the functions and what each of those functions do uh, for these classes. And the mechanism that we use we meaning us object oriented designers is something called so let me I'll actually write this out to uh, ferret out the member functions of classes use a sequence diagram so that's what this thing is let me Save this where it's going to ultimately need to be. And we'll call this um, just sequence. So the way you read this is time marches from top to bottom. Okay. And you generally have a thick line off to the left, and then you have several boxes up here with the vertical line dropping from each. Each of these boxes represents an object. Now I'm using the, that term object very specifically. Not a class, an object. One thing that I would never do is I would never say night, because that is a class, right? I'm not interested in the blueprint which is what a class is. Yes, a class is a blueprint for creating as many things as I want, a blueprint to a house. I can create as many houses as I want, a night I can create as many nights, so on and so forth. I want actual examples. So I want to follow, in essence, the lead that, was, that I kind of uh, set when I put people up here. We had Starry. We had Stormy. We had the Sword. We had the Lance. And we had Todd. Which is, so I, I'm going to write Todd was the random. 
Yes, indeed. I'm a little bit unpredictable. You should see me in the grocery store just randomly grabbing stuff. All right, doesn't mean that the family doesn't eat well, but at least they're uh, never bored with having the same thing every night. Tonight it's a can of peas. Tomorrow night it's um, it's a bag of flour. All right. <clears throat> All right. This here is. It, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw out the sequence of events that occurs in the application. And uh, this is something outside of all of these. And in this case, this would be main here on the left. So recall when this whole thing began and Wes was playing the part of main. What, was, uh, what were some of the things that Wes did? Talk to Stormy and Starry. Um, all right, right. So remember that before we allowed the joust to even begin, that Maine had to ask Starry and Stormy, are you on your horse? And uh, are you exhausted? Yes. So what the way I actually represent that is I draw a line all the way. Whoops. Uh, let's see, tablet driver, you have attempted to toggle. Would you like to open them? No. All right. Sorry, there's a little button on the pen that I hit. Mm. Hang on, let me do that again. Get it all the way there. Okay. The question being asked. So, what I do is I draw a line all the way to the object that, that I want to talk to, or in this case, that Maine wants to talk to. And I ask the question, R, and I'll even write it in kind of C++ style with underscores here, are you exhausted? I'll even show it as a function, right? I'll put so that that almost looks like a function call, yeah. So when I ask Starry whether or not Starry is exhausted, then what does Starry do? Checks. Very good. So uh, what what we'll do is we'll informally write a little bit of information here. We will say. Um, Give me, kind of give it to me in, in code. So you said check stamina. Give it to me like a C++ compiler would understand. If stamina... So if stamina is greater than zero, then what? Uh, false. Are you exhausted? If it's, then we want to say no, so false. So what I will do then is I will do it like, whoa, all right. Now there are actually various methodologies for how you put specific notation on these things. I'm doing a little, little bit informally because I'm interested in you understanding the value of the diagram and I don't really care about all the drawing conventions. And uh, let me write for a little bit and then I'll explain. Return true, else return false. Now, the amount of it, I, I've done a pretty close job to what that would look like in C++ code, but not exactly. And really, the amount of information that you put there is a matter of personal preference, enough for you to understand exactly what's happening. And what I'm going to do is I need to make this a dashed line. And let me... Oh, darn it. I hate when that happens. Um, I 
No, it's all weird. There's something, I think. Nope. Nope. All right. There we go. What? Uh, so, all right. Let me let me uh, write then. What this is going to be is this is either going to be true or false being returned. Okay. There is the after this question is asked, then the exact same question is asked of Stormy. Yes. So what I need to do is I need to basically take everything that you see here and I need to repeat it except it's going to come to this line right here. Yes. And the only reason I'm not going to do it is that one, I want to save a little time and two, I have a very limited amount of vertical real estate here. So imagine all that's there. Uh, we're also, oh, I'm not going to show it, but we have a similar set of arrows when we ask Starry and Stormy the questions, are you on your horse? And then I might put a little tick mark here, are you on your horse? And I might say return the on horse variable, yeah? Which is going to be true or false. Okay, so I'm not going to put any of those other functions. I want to get right down to what happens after I ask those four questions. Then uh, what does main then ask of Starry? Wield. Wield. Very good. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say wield. Now, when main turned to starry and said, remember it had the, the, those full with the w finger wagging and everything, wheeled, then what did starry do? Say that again. Random number. There's a random number in there, absolutely. Um, turn to his weapon. Ah, turn to his weapon and then... Turn to the web. Huh? Did Starry have the sword or the lance? Uh, did Starry have the sword or the lance? I don't know. Anyone remember that? I don't think it matters. No, it doesn't matter, but I'm, I'm willing to be accurate. Hey, how about the sword? I say the sword. No, no, no. I say the lance. We're just, I'm just full of excitement. All right. Um, turn to the lance, and what did Starry say to the lance? Uh, yes, the question was asked, did I hit? But there was something asked before that. Ah, I remember that, that in order to be able to use the weapon, Starry had to lose amount, an amount of stamina, and uh, the lance is the keeper of that stamina required. And so Starry turned to the lance and said, get stamina required. Now, when the lance was asked that question, what did the lance do? Gate just returned it right. It's just a little, here it is. All right, look down at that piece of paper there. Said, aha, it costs three to use or four to use. Here it is. And then I'm going to make this dashed. So I'm about to pause and talk about what I'm drawing here. Let me just finish this thought and then... Uh, this will be um, this would be the stamina, right? This yes, thank you. The stamina required. And if I look back here, right here, yes, and that's part of what the weapon has. Okay, stamina. I'll just abbreviate it. Stamina required. All right. When that number comes back, then what did Starry do with that number? Subtracted it from his own stamina, right? So that number was given back, and then the knight reduced his stamina by that amount. So now we can say, I can go ahead and write here, after that comes back, then what Starry did was to take the stamina 
and, and minus equaled, that's the same as saying stamina equals stamina minus, stamina required. Or whatever came back, whatever this number is that came back. <clears throat> and then more stuff happens, and more stuff happens, so I'll put a question mark right here. And then uh, let's go back to where this all started. This started with Maine right here saying wield. What is the very next? What was the next thing that Maine was aware of? So, so Maine turned to Starry and said wield. And then eventually Starry said to Maine, hit or, hit. hit or not hit, right? A true or a false? And so eventually, so I've got magic happens here where the big question mark is. Eventually, everything comes back here. And I would make that a dashed line. And then this would be uh, a true or a false being returned. All right. So let me now back up and talk about what we're looking at here. <clears throat> Whenever there is a message sent, a function invoked, whatever terminology you want to use, there is a solid arrow drawn, and that changes the flow of control. Now think in terms of Wes turning to Starry and saying wield. As soon as Wes does that, he's lost control. He has to sit and wait for things to happen. That's what I mean by losing control, not, not losing control in the sense that you're headed down a mountain without brakes. But uh, is now asking Starry to do something. So now Starry has to do several things before relinquishing that control back to West, back to Maine. And so that is done with a combination of here's where control is given to someone else with a solid arrow. You gain control back with the dashed arrow. Now what this always corresponds to is the solid arrow is always a function call or a member function call. We can do this with the first project. So let me t uh, create a little box here. Let me do the whole thing in a different color. I'll do it in this dark gray. I could do, um, I could call this let me erase oops WC is our web counter, a web counter object. I don't know, we may have called it different things, but ultimately for that first project, you had a line of code that was web counter WC, right? That's, that's what this is. This is a web counter object. What did you do with main? What did main do with WC? What was the first thing? Maybe something like Set, and who knows what you set it to, 20 maybe? Did WC, should be able to make this, there we go. And then this was a dashed line coming back. So what happened was main, and using my terminology, relinquished control, gave control to the web counter saying, set yourself to 20, and then here, did something like counter equals 20, or right, which was that variable that came in. And then what happened after that? It was just, it simply, the function ended. It could have been a return, but nothing was returned. If you recall, this is a void function. Nothing's returned. However, the function does return. It relinquishes control, so that's what happened. Main says set, and then eventually their WC does whatever it does, and then it returns. And then you would have another one, maybe a hit, a hit, right? Various things like that. In fact, you could put a little bit of code in here because it was a little complex. What it was the first thing that happened? There was an if statement, right? If, if, the, if 20 is less than 0, then counter equals 0. So there's a little bit of code in there. Yeah, this, the nightmares are coming back, aren't they? All right. 
But so you see, that's what this diagram is doing: is it's showing uh, the messages that you're sending to various objects, and those messages end up being the names of member functions. And what happens in those member functions? Well, whatever you have blocked out here. So looking up here, this is a member function called are you exhausted? And which class does this member function belong to? If I, it doesn't belong to main. Main's actually calling the function in the same sense that main is calling the set function. Night. So the easy way, kind of the, the, uh, the, well, the easy way of figuring out what do the, all these member functions belong to, just look where on the solid lines, where do the arrowheads end? Where does the arrowhead on are you exhausted end? Sorry. Which, who is a? Where does wield end? Sorry. Who is a knight? So the knight class must have an are you exhausted member function, and it must have a wield member function. Where does the get stamina required arrowhead end? Which is a? Weapon. So the weapon class must have a get stamina required function. Yes? All right. Uh, another thing to keep very to note is that I can draw the flow of control of this application without picking up my pencil. Okay, so if you have to pick up your pencil to complete this thing, once it's all said and done, then you're doing it wrong. And you have two types of arrows. You have the solid arrow, which means you're relinquishing control to some class or some object. And the dashed line means that it is now done and it's giving control back to whoever called the function in the first place. Okay, any questions on this? Yes? Knights are going to do all this simultaneously, right? Uh, the, uh, knights are going to do it simultaneously. Well, what will happen is you'll do all this code t for Starry, and then you'll do the exact same set of code for uh, Stormy. Actually, I should start here. This wield, this wield occurs for Starry, and then this whole block that I blocked in red then occurs with the arrowheads going to Stormy and to Sword. So th it doesn't actually happen simultaneously. One happens after another. I gave you the example last time of if I asked you to roll two dice and tell me what the sum is, but you only add one die. It's, even though that seems like it's impossible to roll two dice simultaneously because you don't have two dice, I can't have the two knights joust simultaneously because I don't have two threads of control. But you can roll the die two times and add them together and tell me what the sum is, and that gives the illusion of them appearing at the same time. Likewise, you can have both knights wield before you figure out whether one lost or the other, giving the appearance of simultaneity. Okay? So... What I want you to do now is I want you to go back. There are only five minutes left in class. If you haven't been scribbling this down, scribble it down. I've got a big question mark right here that needs to be filled in. And there are other things that happen as well. Uh, so you need to think back of all the things that happen in this joust. So use this as a tool to try and draw out what these member functions are and what they do. Okay? And I will... Uh, make sure you're on the right, right track over the next five minutes here. I'm going to
six forty seven as I have here. between now and Wednesday is you need to take, uh, you haven't had time to finish this, you have to take this drawing and sit down with that, that last 20 minutes of last Friday and watch that video and as those five people are talking with each other, you watch it happen and you'll see exactly what's written here is exactly how they're communicating with each other and it should fill in all the blanks for you. As soon as Starry turns to the lance and says something, by golly, that's an arrow going to the lance. And as soon as the lance gives something back, that's a dashed line going back, right? So get it all filled in, and we'll pick it up on Wednesday. <laughs>